Thank you. Sorry, Dylan wasn't able to give a presentation to explain some of the things about the understand part. I'll, I'll cover that a little bit. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to thank Michelle and uh, uh, Maria for inviting me to be here today to talk to all of you on a subject that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, so to set the stage a little bit, um, I do want to start out with the fact that um, you know, the Artemis program is looking at going to the moon and, and onto Mars. It's uh, planned in several segments. The first one is just to get humans back to the lunar surface again. Once we've done that, we will do what's called the foundational exploration. Let's add things to this, the unpressurized rover, pressurized rover staying a little longer, um, maybe a habitat. Once we've understood that a little bit and we've performed some demonstrations of critical technologies, we'll go on two particular pathways. One of them hopefully will be how do we sustain our operations on the lunar surface and evolve them to include um, greater science, uh, more uh, resource uh, extraction, economical aspects, um, and um, human, human activities. The other will be, how do we send humans to Mars? And we had a very good presentation on that the other day um, and how we develop those technologies going forward. You may or may not be aware, but NASA also has a major robotic program to go back to the moon called the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. This is different than has been done in the past where typically NASA will ask for proposals for complete missions, um, they're selected through peer-reviewed science uh, in our science mission directorate. Um, <clears throat> and then that whole mission goes from beginning to end um, all internally. NASA thought that as we're going towards commercialization of space, why don't we turn over the actual delivery of our science and our payloads to a company that can um, devote their resources to making that more efficient? And so they started the program. You see here um, uh, missions that are planned between 2023 and 2026. Several of those are aimed at the South Pole, which is an area of, of interest that I'll talk about more. Um, one of those, sadly, the company went out of business, uh, Mastin, so they're still trying to determine what will, whether that will be replaced or not. But we have four missions going to the South Pole in particular. Two of them are very closely um, related to understanding resources. Um, you may have heard of Viper yesterday, which is a rover that will go into smaller permanently shadowed craters near the Nobile uh, crater area. As a precursor to that mission, we are flying what's called Prime One, which is the drill in the mass spectrometer that will show up on Viper in an individual lander to test out those technologies maybe find something outside the permanently shattered crater, but mostly to, to um, work on the operational aspects. So ISRU, in situ resource utilization. Basically, we define that as any process or service that harnesses and utilizes in situ resources for robotic, crew exploration, commercial operations. And I put in situ in italics because besides the natural resources that were just talked about and what Dylan would have talked about. We consider trash, waste, disposed hardware as in situ resources, and you'll see that philosophy coming along later. The first step is basically understand. What are the resources? What's the environment? What's the terrain like? Once you know that, you can then start understanding how you would acquire those resources, ex extract them and then eventually turn those and process them into products. We look at two major products, mission consumables and feedstocks. The mission consumables are the propellants, fuel cell reactants, life support commodities, and, and consumables like water, oxygen, and such. The feedstocks are what we would give to manufacturing and construction folks so that they can do their jobs. Two things to think about. One is, is that when we talk about ISRU, it's a lot of different disciplines. And I would mention that during the NASA Constellation program, 
I funded several studies at the International Space University on ISRU. Those studies were very interesting, but it showed me two things. One is, well, three actually, um, having international involvement from lots of different company, countries, lots of different cultures, and lots of different backgrounds and disciplines. They had lawyers, they had, you know, not everybody was an aerospace engineer. Um, and so how those all three came together to give reports on ISRU that we did was brought very interesting perspectives. Most of my charts are very dense. The point is for you to get copies of them afterwards to look at them. Um, and I will highlight certain points. So this chart, if you're not aware of it, NASA released what is called the Moon to Mars Blueprint Objectives. They released those officially at the IAC in September last year. Recently, they re-released those um, at the Space Symposium. Everything that NASA wants to do in space for human exploration is listed as these objectives. So please take the time to look at them. And so I've gone through that document and I've pulled out the objectives that deal with ISRU in one of three areas. Understanding the resources, how would you use those resources, and a very interesting new area, how to be responsible in space in using those resources. So the black arrows are the ones that, in particular, my program and what NASA is doing needs to focus on that are driving what we do and how we do it. The color coding goes with the different mission directorates and purpose of space exploration. So the green are, are the science, the purple are the infrastructure and technology, the blue is transportation and exploration, and the red are operations. So ISRU crosses the board in all of these different disciplines within NASA. At the bottom right is the recurring tenants. These are things that no matter what NASA does are important for why we are doing them. So international partnerships, industry involvement, interoperability and standards, modularity. These are things that are all very important no matter what we do. So we follow those tenets as well. Responsible use is part of that. And I'll point out that when we talk about resource assessment in those green areas and the red, it doesn't just say understand the resources. It uses very specific term called understand the resource um, potential, which goes with the mining company that Dylan would have uh, reserved potential. So from an ISRU perspective, we also have a time and an evo uh, a locational evolution. We are starting at the South Pole for many, many different reasons. And there are two major resources, Highland Regolith, which is very high in aluminum, oxygen, silicon, and calcium and then potentially the water and the volatiles that are in the permanently shadowed craters. So we want to go after those. We want to go after what's the easiest to get to, to begin with, and what requires the minimum of infrastructure. As time goes on, we are thinking about where else would we go, what other resources. So when you start going towards the equatorial mare regions, you find out that there's ilmenite, there's pyroclastic glasses that have iron, titanium, even solar wind volatiles that might include things like helium-3 if you're interested in that. There's also the creep, the rare earth elements and the radioactive materials such as thorium that are important. <clears throat> so on the right hand side you see the commodities, the things that we're interested in. Initially we're interested in the oxygen, the water hydrogen, and basically regolith um, either bulk or refined for construction. We're now starting to get into more refined resources, the metals, the silicon ceramics, and the construction feedstocks. Eventually, we'll get into greater manufacturing feedstocks, fuels and plastics, and food and nutrients. So from a technology program, the way we work is from low technology readiness level on the early stage innovation side all the way to flights, we have different technology solicitations and portfolios that we, we work with industry, academia, internally and externally with industry. The plan we released a couple of years ago has focused primarily on oxygen and water mining on the moon. The plan that we just released recently in the last month or so has been showing that we're now getting more into the metals 
and the construction feedstocks. You'll see that in our solicitations and the things that we're working on. Next iterations, we'll start getting into the, as I mentioned, the waste processing, the production, food, nutrients. We have a question mark as to how quickly we should start reconsidering our Mars ISRU work. And so this is our current plan, and I have two caveats here. One is if budgets continue to be a problem, things move to the right. The other is that we are getting some very interesting industrial involvement, commercial involvement in space, so maybe things might move to the left. But the idea is we're following two pathways, that what's in the permanently shadowed pathway, how would we understand and, and potentially mine water. The other is regolith. It's all over the moon, different flavors of it or different types, but still we know quite a bit about it. So the idea is we would fly one or two technology demonstrations for, for these different areas, eventually have what we call a pilot plant. This is an end-to-end -end demonstration. All the steps that would be included from excavation to delivering a product at a scale and for a duration that would reduce the risk of somebody coming along and doing it for real commercially or, or otherwise. So after the pilot plant, you see on the right-hand side those mission objectives that, that we're trying to, to aim towards. How do we develop those technologies to extract the resources? How do we use them? And how do we do it responsibly? On the bottom, you'll see that I've also highlighted several power-related technology demonstrations. ISRU requires a lot of power, so there are two demonstrations that we're working on. One is a vertical solar array for the polar regions. The other is a 40 kilowatt nuclear reactor. So how those power demonstrations tie to ISRU and construction demonstrations is an ongoing discussion. Last two charts I'll try to end with now that we're starting to think about resource extraction and doing all these things. Before we do it, 